Welcome to the Reef Resilience webinar, Preparing for Coral Bleaching in the Western Indian Ocean with David Obura. Thanks for joining us today or this evening, depending where in the world you are. My name is Kristen Mays, and I'm the Communications Manager for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network and your host for this webinar. The webinar is brought to you through the support of NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Before we begin with the presentation, just like to go over a few housekeeping items. The webinar for today will be just shy of an hour. We'll have a presentation and then there'll be a question and answer period at the end, followed by an opportunity for additional question and answers online on the network forum, which is the member only discussion forum for managers and practitioners. And I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the presentation. There are two ways you can ask questions during the webinar Q&A. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions as they come to mind. And we'll keep track of these for the end of the presentation. Or you can raise your hand during the question session of the webinar, and I'll take your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on that small little hand icon on just to the left of your name on the toolbar. And if you're having technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or see any, seeing any of the slides or using your hand raising tool, just uh, send us a message via the chat box and we'll try and resolve the issue. Before I introduce you to our presenter, David Obura, um, we'd like to ask you two questions. Just give a second here. It'll pop up on the, the screen. Please select, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and select whether you're a scientist, researcher, manager, student, or other. And we'll take just a second to give you some time to make your selection. Okay, so quick tally of the results. It looks like, wow, even, <laughs> very even across the board. It's like that never happens. But you can see the results here. 38% scientist, researcher, 38 field-based manager. And then we have some students um, and office-based managers. That's helpful um, for a presenter to know who he's presenting to, who's in the audience. Um, and one more question for you. We'd like to know if you've ever seen or experienced coral bleaching at your site, and or ever. <laughs> Give you a little bit more time to answer this question. Wow, that was sad. Sad result. Um, we're looking at 91% of you have seen coral bleaching in your site. So thank you. Thanks for participating in the poll. Like I said, it's helpful for, for David to know who he's speaking to in the audience, and it's helpful for us to know who the, who the webinars are reaching. So we're fortunate to hear from Dr. David Obura today. Thank you once again, David, for presenting. David is a director of the nonprofit research organization Cordio, and for those of you on the webinar, not in the Western Indian Ocean, stands for Coastal Oceans Research and Development in the Indian Ocean. And they are based in Kenya and work throughout the Western Indian Ocean region. David's research is focused on coral bleaching, reef resilience and recovery, and regional scale biogeography and ecosystem dynamics. Since 2009, Cordio has run a bleaching alert in summer months. And with the high risk of bleaching this year, they're working to promote monitoring of this upcoming bleaching event. So I'm now going to pass it over to David, who is going to talk to us about how we can monitor this upcoming bleaching event. Thanks, David. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Um, and good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who's um, on the webinar. I can't see anybody's names, but I see there are 27 people online, so that's great. Thanks for joining us. Um, 
in case you can't hear me very well, um, let us know right away, and I'll have to switch. Um, I'll have to switch my system. Um, so just just to make sure, okay. Um, I seem to have sorry. I seem to have lost the main screen now uh, with the presentation on it. So I've got the, my own PowerPoint slide up. Um, okay, so I'll start into that. So this is about preparing uh, for the coral bleaching um, that's about to start happening in our region in 2016. Um, now, this is an effort that's really happening under some support from the Indian Ocean Commission, uh, financed through the European Union, to do the GCRMN, Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, reporting for coral reefs in the region this year. And then there's a lot of other organizations involved as well, um, as you can see from all the logos. Now, bleaching in our region, as I think you all know, um, you have a lot of experience that bleaching happens between January and May or June. Um, and so what I've done for this presentation and tried to do in the past is to simplify a basic bleaching response strategy um, spread over those months. And so I'll, I'll go through that in this slide. Um, so just a bit of background, um, 2016 is very likely to be a major bleaching year for us. Um, already 2015 um, was reported as the hottest year ever, globally reported, um, and the graph at the top right there shows the anomalies, the, um, the, the warmth above the background year, showing 1998 when we had very bad bleaching was, was the hottest year ever at that point. But you can see since then, almost every year has been close to as hot as 1998. And in the last three years, 2014, 2015, and now this year, um, are even hotter than 1998. So um, we're this uh, indicates there will be a lot of bleaching. The West Indian Ocean is already starting the season very hot. Um, the figure at right shows the, um, the amount of heat that's spread all over the oceanic the outer ocean regions, and that all comes in towards us in the coastal regions during the next few months. And then the El Nino and the Indian Ocean Dipole are, are very positive. We hear about them a lot, but basically when they're very positive and very red, as you can see, that adds to the, to the heating signal. So, And there has been a lot of bleaching in the Pacific and the Caribbean in late 2015, um, and we're the next region to bleach in the cycle of the seasons around the world. So we should be ready to respond. Um, now, this what I'm presenting to you is, as I said earlier, it's part of the effort we're doing for G sermon reporting um, for 2015 to 2016. And the results of this bleaching monitoring will be included in that report. So we were going to bring out the report a little bit earlier. But given that this is such a major event and that so many of you and others are interested in monitoring the bleaching, I think we'll delay the publication or the release of that report until we um, get the results in from the bleaching. Now, this presentation is quite heavy on text, um, and it can be a bit of a challenge to give a presentation like this, um, sort of remotely like this. Uh, with you reading a lot of text on the screen. But I've done this because I want the presentation to be useful afterwards when people access it, to read it, to try and plan their bleaching response. So if you bear with me on, on the amount of text, and I'll try and guide you through it um, relatively easily. But this is a simple overview of a basic bleaching response plan. There are basically four steps um, to a response plan, and I'll go through those um, in, in step during the presentation so you can see that. Now, key references and resources are listed on the last page of this presentation, um, and these will all be available both on the um, on the Reef Resilience Network um, that we're on right now, as well as on a dedicated web page which we'll maintain at Cordia. And there's also a manual, a detailed explanation of the methods that I present here in a companion report that accompanies this presentation. 
Now, as you can see in the uh, arrows at the bottom, we're in the middle of January now, so this is the tail end of the preparation period we should be having for bleach and response plan, and moving into the next phase, which will be the first observations, and already there's some observations that are starting the bleaching in the region. And then, depending on where you are in the region, the further south you are, the earlier the bleaching starts, in February or March, the further north, the later it starts, we go into the monitoring phase, uh, of bleaching, mortality, and recovering. And then throughout all of this is the fourth phase of communication uh, should be happening all the way through um, because of the interests of many different groups in, um, in the bleaching. So I'll go through phase and preparation um, now. There's a number of questions that should be asked in terms of guiding your preparation for bleaching. I think many of you have answered these already, um, and you know your resources, so I'll just go through this one relatively quickly. But really these guiding questions are why are you monitoring bleaching, what staff or volunteers or what staff are available to do the monitoring, um, basically the, the, the effort that you have at hand, and um, this could be um, divers, it could be fishermen, it could be students, scientists, or it could be marine park staff. And then also, very importantly, do you have funding to support the monitoring? Because going into the field is expensive. Um, and if you don't have support, can you get it in kind, such as through dive boats or snorkeling boats that are already going to the fields, or fishermen that are already going out fishing? Um, now, the more complex your answers are to the above, the more detailed you're likely to be able to collect data. Um, and I'll go through a couple of different levels um, of data collection that, that are possible, but I'll emphasize the, the basic level because I think that's the most feasible and we'll get the most information from as many sites as possible if we follow that. Um, and the preparation phase, you really need to go through the preparation of all the different phases from A to D. Um, the first, the questions about why you're monitoring, guides, how you prepare. And then the next phase is going into the first observations and determining already from the start how you may hear about the first observations of bleaching, who's going out often enough um, to tell you about the bleaching. The third phase, C, the monitoring phase, um, is perhaps the one that you're most interested in for this presentation in terms of what methods to apply um, and what data will that give, and so I'll go through that in a bit more detail. Um, and in order to collect data, you need to prepare the main people, uh, the stakeholders, the individuals, the people who will be in the water doing the monitoring so that they know what they're doing. And then the fourth part, D, communication, is identifying um, who you need to communicate to about the bleaching event. So the responsible agencies and authorities, the various stakeholders that are out there, the general public, and then using the media and social media effectively to, to get the message out. And the important thing is that many of these people hear about the bleaching, just as you need to prepare your response plan uh, before it starts, it's also good to communicate out to the various interested parties um, before um, communicate out to people um, before the bleaching happens so you can tell them uh, what's going on. Just have a question. Is is the sound good enough? Oh, okay. So I've been told that the sound is cutting a lot. Um, so I think what I'm going to try and do um, is try and change my network over here, and hopefully I'll stay on. If not, I'll hook up right away so we can start up again. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. All right, sorry about that. Um, uh, and David, this is Kristen. You, you sound really good on my end. Um, 
Okay. So maybe it was someone else's network, but you okay, found so that was, All right, bouncing back and forth. Okay, um, so I'll get back on to the, uh, to the presentation over here. We were on preparation, right? So, yeah, so the thing is to start communicating right away uh, before the bleaching happens. Um, and I'll come back to this at the end, um, talking about uh, phase D. So, first observations. Um, now, before bleaching happens, I think, so you're all here because you're anticipating bleaching, so you're relatively um, well informed um, and warned about it. Um, so you are getting news and forecasts about, about the potential for bleaching, but then the question is, what happens in the fields? Do you have people who are regularly on or over the reefs that can alert you to the first signs of bleaching? And this is an, an essential part of it, because it can really happen start any time. If you only go out once a month to some sites, you may miss the onset of the bleaching, and then it's, it's full-blown uh, by the time you get out there. So having in the network some uh, dive or snorkel guides, some fishermen, some marine park rangers who are regularly going out in the field for other things, and also even um, pilots uh, flying small planes to, to hotels or to remote sites, they often fly low enough that they can actually see the white uh, corals through the surface. So a very important part of this phase of bleaching of the response plan is to be in touch with these potential first observers. Now, how to observe first bleaching? They need to be able to recognize bleached corals from other white uh, things in the sea. Um, but basically, once bleaching starts, it's it's at such a high you know at such a high level that they should be able to recognize it. But again, there's some slides at the end that can show some bleached corals, and we can provide some materials that you can show to some of these first observers uh, what bleached reefs will look like. There's also the forecasting mechanisms um, that I think you already linked into um, the NOAA website. Up here, the Coral Reef Watch program has fantastic. Um, warning products now. These maps are all done at five kilometer resolution now, so it's very highly specific for for our reefs over here. Um, and then what we do at Cordia is we take these maps and reports, we combine it with information on the El Nino, the Indian Ocean Dipole um, index at right now. We also look at the monsoon winds and if it's very calm, if there have been cyclones and put out this bleaching alert every two weeks. So I think many of you already know this, but if you're not receiving them by email, please send us an email to this bleaching at cordioea.net, and we can send it to you. This was the first alert we did this year, and we'll be putting another one out. We try and do it on the 1st and the 15th of every month, so there'll be one coming out tomorrow, an updated one. And in this, we also really need to have these first observations of bleaching, so we can say where bleaching is already happening, because that then gives the next few sites, as we progress northwards, um, a sign that bleaching may be coming in the next few weeks. So once you have the first observations of bleaching in this first period, the next major part, and this is where a lot of the effort and planning and training needs to be put, is the actual monitoring. And there's a lot of guiding questions that have to be asked about monitoring. I mean, there's the how, when, where, what you monitor, and so on. We try and provide as much specific guidance as possible. Some of you already have monitoring programs in place um, that you can build on uh, for monitoring bleaching, and you need to make sure that the bleaching monitoring suits your purposes locally as well. And also this issue of data management and holding the data, and we will be able to help with guidance on that as we move through. Um, if you have different people, um, with different levels of expertise uh, available, then you can have monitoring happening at different levels by the different people. Um, but that makes it a bit more complex for you to manage the system. But basically what we've tried to do is identify three levels of monitoring that can be done. These are detailed in a accompanying guide or manual, which, which I'll show to you on a, on a web page at the end of the presentation. Um, and in this presentation, there's a basic summary of these methods. Um, this presentation will be available afterwards. You can download it or watch it online. And these are action buttons. So at the basic level of monitoring, 
uh, you can have uh, for people with little experience in monitoring or observing corals underwater, you can estimate the proportion of colonies affected at the sites, 50%, 100%, uh, with little or no taxonomic information. In presentation, this, this clicking on this button takes you the detailed table that instructs you how to how to do, operate this method. And I'll come back to this uh, at the end of the presentation to go through this in more detail. This button here takes you back to this slide and we can look at the intermediate level of monitoring. And This is where you get visual estimates of, by number of coral colonies that are affected by bleaching. Whether they're normal bleached or dead, often with genus level identification. Again, there's a table, color coded green, to give you details, information on how to apply this monitoring method. If I go back, and then the high level monitoring, what we do over here is this is much more area-based census, so this gives us the amount of coral tissue or the biomass, um, you know, the percent of coral tissue that is bleaching or normal and so on, and this requires more effort um, with laying out transects and so on, and again, you can click on that button and you can get to the description of the methodology. What I'd like to do is, is go to the basic method over here because I think with the um, this sort of addresses the most um, urgent need we have, which is to get reliable information on how much bleaching there is from as many sites as possible, as broad a range of sites as possible across the region and involving as many different stakeholders as possible. Now this method can be done by many different people because it doesn't need you to identify coral genera. Uh, you do, observers do need to be able to know a hard coral from, for example, a soft coral or a sponge and so on. But in general, we're most interested in the percentage of bleaching that's due to this event. And some of those soft corals, for example, will bleach as well. So including those in the estimates is not such a, not such a bad thing. Um, it's based on, it's the sort of thing, if you look down at the bottom over here, the ideal target population for this. And this is where people who are going out to the reefs already and working, such as dive masters, snorkel guides, uh, MPA rangers or staff who are doing routine patrols or checking tickets or fixing buoys, they could also get in the water. And if you're already going out to the reef for your work, adding 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes dedicated to, to applying this method will provide us with a lot of information from many different sites. Um, as opposed to having to have the funding for, you know, for a dedicated monitoring trip where you're putting down transects and not doing other work, the funding for that may not be available. So I think this is the one to really focus on for many of the groups in the region. It's based on a five to six minute time swim, so coming back up to the uh, top of the table. Um, the diver needs to pick their sampling location um, to swim over that area for five to six minutes observing the reef. Uh, it might be about you know, 50 meters along the reef front or something like that, looking at all the hard corals uh, that can be seen and then estimating the percentage of corals that uh, bleach. So it could be none, less than 1%, low, 1 to 10%, medium, 10 to 50%, high, 50 to 90%, or extreme, which should be greater than 90%. Um, and just recording that for that five or six minute period. And the thing is, in 15 or 20 minutes, you could do four of these samples, three or four of these samples moving along the reef, providing uh, multiple estimates of bleaching. And you can also use the same percentages for mortality if you can recognize the death after the bleaching of the corals. So this value really gives, this method gives an overall sense of the look or the feel of the coral community. Um, you can also, moving down the table a bit, use photographs to help build up, um, to make the method more reliable and as a backup. Um, by taking, if you have an underwater camera, take two or three general views of each of these um, locations where you're recording the percentage, two or three general views so we know what it looks like, and then ten or more vertical images. If you have the camera about one meter above the substrate, above the, the bottom, a vertical shot, um, take uh, 10 or more of these, make sure they're spread apart so they're not overlapping at all. Then we can also look at these photographs afterwards in a couple of different ways um, to, to back up your estimate of the percent of bleaching 
um, in that community. The value of the photographic method is also that if you don't feel or if the people who are in the water are not comfortable enough to do the estimation themselves, they could just collect these photos and then other people, such as we can put together a regional team, who can go through these collections of photos um, and, and estimate the amount of bleaching from the photos. So the photographic method um, enables us to extend our reach a lot, particularly for people, for example, in a, in a dive group, a tourist group, dive master may not have time to, to look at the reef for 15 minutes and do the estimation, but they can certainly take photos as they're swimming along uh, with their clients. Um, so there's a lot of benefits uh, to using this, this method. Um, I'll go back. Um, okay, so going back to um, this slide on monitoring. The next slide will talk about the uh, communicating once you have information on the amount of bleaching. Oh, sorry. Um, two, one, one of the biggest questions about monitoring is when to monitor. Um, now, ideally, uh, coral bleaching events unfolds over about two months or three months. So ideally, if you could go to the field and track these sites every two weeks, that would be great but it depends a lot on your budget and resources. So um, one, of the, um, one of the key uh, things to think about is uh, before the bleaching events happening, happens, if you can get a baseline, if you have enough resources, you get a baseline of the conditions before the bleaching happens, because there's always some background bleaching. This is also good for practice, so the people involved can actually get some practice in applying the methods. But then also the good thing about doing this baseline, sorry, is that um, you can pre-select your sites. Um, so you can decide I have uh, three or five dive sites or three or five snorkeling sites and these are where we're going to do the monitoring. You go to them. They should have moderate to good coral cover and diversity um, because there's little point in monitoring a full bleaching event at a very degraded site. Um, and then by applying the first set of measurements before the bleaching, you have that first data point and then you don't do it again until the first observations tell you that bleaching has started somewhere. Then you go off and start. Uh, monitoring every two weeks. Now the issue is if you only have limited resources and you can only go out once or twice or a very small amount of times, when should you do the monitoring? Now the most important time to monitor is at the peak of the bleaching event, when the bleaching and the white corals are at their maximum. Um, now of course it's a bit of guesswork to identify exactly when this will be, but we can help you with that. But if you go out before this, then of course you haven't you haven't measured the maximum amount of bleaching that has happened, so you don't know how bad it got afterwards. If you wait too long after the um, peak of a bleaching event and there's some mortality or recovery of the corals, you don't necessarily know how much bleaching there was. It's very hard to identify mortality and associate it with the bleaching rather than something else. So really the peak of the bleaching event is the best. If you can only go out twice, then if you go out at the peak of the bleaching event and then give up again about six to eight weeks later, then you get a picture of the amount of uh, mortality or recovery that there has been from that beach. So, um, so there are a lot of decisions you have to take, but you know, through contacts with observers in the field, you know when the bleaching starts and then contact with us in the regional team or national uh, scientists, we can help you identify the best times to go out and do the monitoring if you can only do it once or, or do it twice. So, I mean, the main, one of the main points about this talk is that we do have a network here that we can use to coordinate ourselves. So communicating about bleaching. Now, once you have the information, um, you know, who do you need to reach and why? Um, I think it's very important to consult once, if you identify as a team, your principal audience for communication. It helps a lot if you can consult with them first on how they want to know about the bleach and when and why they want to receive the information, what's their interest and what's the best way to package the results you get to inform them. And then supporting your reports to them with photographs and background information on bleaching. Um, and we can help you with that with some key resources, some videos, photos, and we can put out some key text and sort of uh, templates of text that you can use um, in press releases and letters and so on. And then one of the things we have now, which we didn't have much in the past, is social media. 
you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, we can really use these to uh, present the results that we get from the, from the monitoring as well. I think for key um, stakeholders, keeping them updated on a monthly basis during the bleaching season is probably a good idea. Uh, every two weeks is probably too much. If they don't hear each month, then they forget about it and not be prepped to hear about it. And then on the side of the slide here, I indicate some of the, the four key groups perhaps we should target for communications and perhaps you will target just one or two of these depending on your principal needs. But basically the reef users um, and social media is very good uh, or meetings and briefings when we have staff going out in the field to inform reef users about what's happening. The decision makers and senior management, um, that depends a lot on the culture of your country or your organization and so on, but how to approach them through a, a, a brief, a memo, a letter, or an email, um, you need to decide about that. I think colleagues and peers, um, you can communicate with one another through email lists. The Reef Resilience Forum is available to us for that and will be one of the main um, um, platforms that, that we'll be using as a regional team. And then for the media and the public, um, either press releases or if you know some reporters who are interested, you can provide them with materials um, to hand to them. And then, you know, let's use a hashtag. Let's use the Wire Bleach in 2016 on Facebook and Twitter, certainly, and maybe on other social media as well uh, to report on, um, to communicate about the bleaching that's happening in our region now. Um, so that's the main meat of this presentation. I'll just show you some of the last few slides here um, that give some, um, well, the details of the tables that I just showed you on the basic monitoring method uh, and the intermediate and high-level monitoring methods, and then photographs of the appearance of bleaching and so on. But many of these slides are basically summaries or will be provided in other materials on the web pages, on the online resources that, that we'll make available to you. Um, so, for example, going forward is the monitoring method for basic observations that I just went through with you in some detail. After that is the intermediate method and then the high level method after that. Just going back to the intermediate one, I won't go through these now because of the time available. But if you, if you or your teams uh, have experience in monitoring, you can probably apply these methods without any assistance from outside uh, by going through these, seeing what's recommended, and then adapting it or merging it with what you're already doing in monitoring or assessment methods uh, that you're applying uh, on site. Here's a high one. And then um, just one slide of uh, images of coral bleaching. And of course, we can build up much more than this on the web page and links to other sites that are showing uh, the appearance of bleaching. Um, and in this slide, I've tried to show both the bleached corals, the white corals, and the normal uh, color um, of the same colonies, this sort of panel with a black background down at the bottom. These are basically the same species, uh, you know, adjacent to one another, bleached and unbleached um, for, uh, I guess, five different genera. Some examples of other things that are white on the reef in terms of hard corals. Um, there's normal corals, which have a very pale appearance. It's quite hard um, for inexperienced observers to separate these from observations of pale uh, um, or minor bleaching. And then various diseases on the reef also um, can have white, uh, you know, white pieces of coral associated with them, whether alive still or dead or dying. So these can be quite a challenge to distinguish as well. But in the basic observations, all of these conditions will generally won't account for more than one or five percent of observations. So they shouldn't bias the results too much. And then the last page in the presentation here just summarizes the references and resources um, for this presentation. This is the manual that details these bleaching response methods. Um, and the references used in that manual uh, are summarized over here. Um, I'll show you these a couple of web pages here. So one is the reefresilience.org uh, network. This is the forum where hopefully all of you are registered in on that. And we'll, we'll carry the main discussions on that and make all of these files available as downloads there. I'd also just like to 
I don't know if um, to take you to this page if you'll see it. Um, sorry. I thought I already had it on my desktop somewhere. There you go. We have a, a web page um, with that URL which we maintain on the Cordio website. And basically what we'll have it here, um, so wire bleaching 2016, you can get to the latest forecasts of so the bleaching alert. And then this presentation, bleaching response plan, the manual for coral bleaching um, is available. Um, on the second panel, and also past guides on bleaching response plans for managers by Martin Schudenberg. There's a report from 2004 with uh, bleaching methods. We'll also provide templates for data sheets and reporting in this panel. They're not yet there yet. Uh, it's under development. And then links to the forum, back to the Reef Resilience Forum over here, um, and this webinar will be available from here, and various videos and so on about coral bleaching. So I think I'll go back to the end of the presentation and um, perhaps hand it back to uh, back to Kristen. Now, so thank you. Thank you, David. That was very informative. Um, I'd allow, now like to open up the webinar to questions. Just as a reminder, you can either send me your question directly, and I can read it for you. Or you can raise your hand and I can um, unmute you and you can ask your question directly to, to David. I have a question here. Um, someone wanted to know if it's better to follow or monitor one site in more detail, so looking at monitoring very frequently, or at more sites but in less de detail, so less frequently. Would you mind sharing on that, David? Yeah, okay, thanks, Kristen. Um, so I think, well, especially if you're applying the basic monitoring method, um, then it's definitely better to um, have a range of sites that you observe. Also, because bleaching varies a lot from one location to another, uh, with different depths on the reef, different reef zones. So being able to get consistent information from your area from several different reefs um, is better than only investing effort in just one reef. So rather than doing a high level detail at just one place, I would tend to advocate for going to more sites and trying to visit them as frequently as possible, up, up to every two weeks. Um, but it does depend a lot on your local situation. So I think if you have real strong questions about that, then we're available to, to help advise on that. Thank you. And, and David, can someone then post that question to the network forum? Yes, please, yeah. So that's a good point. Thanks, Kristen. I think in general, if you post your questions to the network forum, then the answers that, that I or others can give on that will be available for everybody to see. Um, so then the, the answers will be useful to, to a much broader range. And if you do send um, questions through email or privately, then of course if it's, if it's of general interest to others, then what I likely do is post the question response back to the, back to the forum. Great. Thanks, David. And um, I'll go over how to join and log into the forum and after you take questions, just um, so everyone can see where, where to go to post those questions. Okay. Okay. Another, another question is, can we send in pictures to get professional expertise if we are not sure if something is bleaching or maybe a di or disease? Uh, yes, it would be great to have submitted your pictures. So the one thing that I mentioned was to actually do the estimations of coral bleaching. Um, we can have uh, people online help you with doing the estimations. But also, yes, if you want to identify corals or disease or distinguish corals from soft corals and so on, then um, posting the photos will help for that. I think what I'd like to do is to work out, and perhaps if one of you online <coughs> has some experience with this, if we can set up something like a Picasso album that is available, easily manageable and available to everybody, then the more open these online or the submission of photos is, the, the better. Um, so we'll try, and, we'll try and sort that out. Okay. Thanks, David. And the 
on the network forum within the group, there is a ability to, to upload photos, and we could always make that the, the ability to have larger files on there if, okay. if we needed it for a group. So it could be another um, good way okay. to keep those okay. photos all in one place. Okay. There's a question about when will the data spreadsheets, the templates, be available on the Cordial website? Okay, so what we're trying to do with that is, um, so we already have some sort of uh, templates that we've used ourselves for monitoring. What I'd like to do is just to make sure that they're general enough for others as well. So I'll try and put some up um, over the weekend or certainly through next week so you have them available. Um, but what we will do is, of course, as soon as you put up something like that, somebody will have some um, adjustments or recommendations and we will keep improving them. So please do give us your feedback. So when you're doing monitoring or, or looking for resources, if the bleaching just happens, perhaps go to the website and make sure you have the most updated materials uh, to use. Okay, thank you. We have a next question. Are there certain coral species that are more susceptible to bleaching? Um, yes, certainly. There's um, the susceptibility of uh, corals to bleaching varies a lot from one genus to another and from one species to another. In general, the branching corals that grow faster, they uh, um, have higher, sort of more speedy metabolism and growth rates. They're much more susceptible to stress and to high temperatures, and they bleach first. So those are the Acroporas, uh, Postulopora, Stylophora, um, so m many of the fast-growing corals and the weedy corals. Um, and then many of the massive corals, which grow more slowly, um, tends can be less susceptible, or if they bleach, they may not they may not suffer so much from the So there's quite a big difference. There's a, we've been using the Coral Watch methodology for several months. Would you advise continuing that in addition to perhaps the basic or if possible the intermediate method or to focus on this method? Um, so I advise you to continue with, with what you're doing and in fact it would be um, whoever that is if you could send to me um, how you've been doing that as an example that would be really useful. But one thing I haven't uh, mentioned yet which I should have is that what we'll do is that the, so the Coral Reef Watch, um, the NOAA program, they have an online system for uploading bleaching observations so that that can be uploaded to a, a global uh, map to show where it is happening in real time and then afterwards you can go to that site and people can download the reports of bleaching. So what we'd like to do is to, as we get bleaching data in, is to do it in a format that we can, uh, you as the bleaching teams or we as a coordination team can update, um, can upload information to that site to update uh, to the world on how much bleaching is happening over here. So the methods that we are, that I've just been through, we are going to make sure that the data that is reported is consistent with what the Coral Reef Watch uh, program is already advising. So the thing is, is there should be high, very high compatibility amongst different methods that are being, um, uh, being implemented. And so if you're already using a system, then ensuring that what you do now is a perhaps adds value to what you've been doing rather than changing the data so that you then can't compare with what you've been doing before. You certainly don't want to break your monitoring screen. Hey, thank you, David. Um, a participant wants you to um, speak a little bit more to the anticipated timing of peak bleaching in the next two to three months in different parts of the Western Indian Ocean based on current ocean and climate info. Okay, yeah, so that's a very uh, pertinent question. Um, now, apparently there's some bleaching has been reported a little bit from the Comoros, uh, from Concomo, and even a little bit in the Seychelles. Now, it's a little bit earlier than the normal uh, sort of major seasonal bleaching that we get in those locations. Um, basically, the hottest temperatures in the sea are just at the end of the local summer, and so as the sun has been in the south, um, 
and is now beginning to move northwards. The bleaching sort of lags about a month behind when the sun has been right over here. So we're expecting bleaching in southwest Madagascar by now, uh, and Devadoc and Tuli are usually the first locations to bleach. There's some signs of bleaching in South Africa and the southern Mozambique can bleach right now. And then as we move into mid-February, we start to expect to see bleaching in the northern part of the Mozambique Channel, northwest, northeast Madagascar, and northern Mozambique in mid-February to early March. And southern Tanzania uh, and central Tanzania might start uh, in mid-March. And Kenya often won't start until, um, I guess, late March. And the same with the Seychelles, late March, early April. That's when it should, should begin. But every year is a bit different. So, and this year is going to be a strong bleaching year. So we might see bleaching a little bit earlier in all of those locations. Thank you. Uh, another question here about the use of drones. Well, in light of the growing mobile technologies, such as the use of drones in coral reef monitoring, under the World Bank's open data initiatives, how can we as Cordio or Indian Ocean Commission capitalize on that opportunity? Yeah, so I mean drones are a fantastic opportunity for getting aerial surveys over sites. Um, so drones have a relatively limited um, uh, spatial range still, I think, in terms of line of sight and how far away they can be from their controller. So I think if you... Um, I, I would not advise about investing in drones at the moment in the West Indian Ocean for local programs because there's many more things to spend money on. But if you have somebody that has a drone um, in the area and they want to fly it out over the reef, um, you know, over a shallow fringing reef or lagoon reefs um, once every two weeks to try and catch the first bleaching, I mean, that would be great if, if, that, if that could happen. Um, so I think the technology is a little bit expensive for general use uh, in the West Indian Ocean here. But then this issue of open data is also very important. And one of the things we'd really like to move towards as part of the regional uh, global coral monitoring network uh, reporting now is rather than just putting out a report as we've been done, doing in the past is that we're collecting, so we're not collecting primary data. That is the intellectual property of researchers and monitoring programs um, on site. But the summary data that you get from reports and publications, like the percent cover of coral at five sites or the percent bleaching, we think we would like to push towards uh, an open data model for that sort of information. So ideally, and this will depend on many of you and the other people that participate in this, is if we can compile these bleaching reports and then we we compile that in the database and make that an, uh, an open data publication, then I will be contributing to this move globally towards uh, an open data system. So I certainly encourage that. And if any of you have some experience with that, I'd certainly like to hear from you. Okay. And, and David, can you talk a little bit about how that data set could be used or what the value of it is? Do you think that gets at about why monitor for bleaching, maybe regionally yeah, so and globally, how that info can be used. Yeah, so the value of monitoring bleaching, I mean, the thing is, so right now, in monitoring the bleaching, there's nothing that we can do about the bleaching event that is about to happen on our doorstep. So what's the point in monitoring it? Um, so we get a bit, because, I mean, you as well, uh, many of you on the webinar, I certainly do because I'm working coral bleaching at the time, and we've been talking about it since 1998. Um, so this is a climate impact that's, you know, been has started 20 years ago or more for coral reefs. Because we forget how spectacular coral bleaching is as a communication um, tool. Um, and I was reminded of this at the Paris COP21 just uh, in December, where a writer came out after a presentation and said, you know, there's, there's no other sign of climate change that is so on-off like coral bleaching. I mean, glaciers melting, the Arctic ice melting happens progressively from one year to the next, but coral bleaching happens one month it's off, another month it's on. And so its power as a communication tool is really important. I think the value for us now is that we do understand when and where coral bleaching happens. We can forecast it quite well. So sharing that credibility that we can go out and we can measure this climate impact 
So we also need to be acting with other sorts of uh, large scale bird environmental changes, interactions with other stresses and so on, just to communicating about how well we can monitor, predict and monitor coral bleaching, I think makes a big difference to then convincing the powers that be, uh, companies, the tourism industry, fishing industry, that we need to invest in management to try and define the amount of bleaching. So I think it's very important to do it for local level management, so you, should, you can show managers that you know what's happening uh, and you, know, you have the credibility to, to speak about the state of the system and then also it's, it's national, regional, global levels so that we really do know what's happening. We can show uh, climate impacts now to motivate for action uh, to reduce the climate, uh, I guess, extent of impact. Thank you, David. We have one question from a participant directly in the audience, so Val, I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Please share your question. Um, I'm not hearing anything. I can see somebody is talking. I'm not hearing anything either. Val, can you unmute yourself? Make sure you're unmuted. It's that little speaker icon to the left of your name. Oh. Okay, looks like. Uh, you can continue to try, but if you'd like to type in your question. I'll, I'll, in the meantime, I'll move on to the next question. So the next one is, is there a prediction for the level of bleaching expected in Mauritius? It seems to be less affected in 1998 than other places in the region. So... Yes, yeah, so Mauritius experienced less bleaching in 1998 because a cyclone went past Mauritius and Reunion um, about three weeks. I think as the bleaching event was developing, the cyclone kicked up and passed offshore of the two islands. So that cooled the water down for about two weeks and at a critical point when it was getting a lot hotter. So there was less bleaching. So for this year, I mean, at the moment, um, the maps are showing really hot temperatures everywhere including around Mauritius. Um, so I would expect that the uh, bleaching there will be um, as high as anywhere else in the West Indian Ocean. In fact, I've just clicked onto the NOAA satellite map now, and there's a hot spot sitting right around Mauritius. So I'd expect this is perhaps going to be the start of the, uh, of the bleaching event. You might see some, some white corals Actually, it's around St. Brandon's Island now, so a little bit north of the main Russian island. But because Mauritius and Reunion are in the cyclone belts, and quite, there are quite frequent cyclones that start up in this part of the West Indian Ocean, it may be that they would be protected again through a cyclone. Um, so, and those we can't predict at all where then they'll, they'll pick up. So as yet, expect a lot, but it, it'll change every, every week to two weeks. So that's, that's why we put out the forecast every two weeks. Wonderful. And here is a it's kind of more of a, a statement or a comment to share. One thing that may be important to note also is any anomalous responses by corals. David mentioned you mentioned David that sensitivity to heat stress and bleaching varies among different species. But it would be interesting and encouraging to know whether there's any adaptation leading to greater resistance among the usually sensitive species. Yes, thank you. That's, that's a good comment that's come in. And, and one thing that many different programs are reporting now is that the species that have traditionally been more sensitive, especially a proper, um, now um, because many of the sensitive individuals might have died back, the sensitive species have been replaced perhaps by uh, slightly more uh, robust ones, is that um, it's not necessarily the case that the cropper, for example, is the first um, genus to start bleaching or to suffer the highest mortality. So there might be quite you know, big differences from what we've observed before. So while we, so I advocated doing the basic monitoring program for most extensive reporting in the region, but the more that can be done with indication of percent bleaching amongst genera to add that 
No, if you have a capability, I will add that to your data. Okay, thanks, David. And I'm sorry to have to wrap up the question and answer session, but we are almost out of time, and I want to be sure we show you where to go on the network forum. There are a few other questions that have come in, but they will not be ignored or overlooked. We will take those questions and post them in the discussion forum, which is on the Reef Resilience website, and David will go ahead and respond to those questions there, and we're feel free to, to go ahead and post comments or additional questions there as well, or um, go ahead and, and share any insight or experience you may, be, you may have or be seeing in your, your site or region. So how to join the forum, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the network forum is the, the Reef Resilience Network's online discussion forum, and it's members only, so it's, it's really created for for you as managers and practitioners to be able to connect with each other, um, with others in your region and in other regions, learn from experience, share resources, and then also connect with experts. So to register, if you aren't already registered for the Network Forum, you can go to the link that's up on the screen, reefresilience.org forward slash register, or you can go to reefresilience.org and click on the Network Forum button in the upper right-hand screen that's shown on that image there. Go ahead and fill out and submit the registration form. Your membership will be approved within 24 hours. We're usually a lot quicker, but um, we like to give a little room. And um, it's important to note that you won't receive an email confirming your approval. Once you're approved, you can go ahead and log into the network with your username and password, and then join the webinar Q&A. And you can see on that image there that there's uh, that first post, it says, oh, nope, different image. But um, the first post on the current network forum is a, a post to follow up from this webinar. And as soon as we conclude the webinar, I'll go ahead and post these additional questions there and um, you'll be able to see those. And for the folks that, a couple of folks that have their hands up, please uh, share your questions there. There's also a Western Indian Ocean group specific to the region. And to access that group, you go to um, select on groups on the left-hand column. You see there it's forum for the main discussion feed. Members, you can go ahead and search and find members in your region, members with um, similar topics of interest that you may have, and then the next on that list right there is, is groups. And so if you click on that and then you can select the Western Indian Ocean group, you can join that group, and there David will post additional um, bleaching, or I'm sorry, um, monitoring protocols and information within that group also. The, now go to the, the list of resources, and here are some links to some additional resources that David mentioned. These will be sent out to you directly as long, along with the link of the webinar recording um, the email list tomorrow. So if you're not on the email list and would like to join, please email us at reefresilience.org. And feel free to share this information along with any of the, the guides that David is sharing with, with other managers who you think might be interested. We're always open to suggestions or comments, so please share those with us at resilience at tnc.org. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight, and a, a special thanks to David for presenting this evening, in, in, or this morning, and sharing the information. I yeah, look forward you, to Chris. connecting. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, and look forward to continuing to connect on this topic via the forum. Thank you.